Um, hi, everybody. Uh, I'm Jiaqi. Very happy to be here to talk about our work um, on active learning for optimal intervention design causal models. Um, so this is joint work with Louis from Harvard, Chandler, Samis, and my advisor, Caroline from MIT. Um, so one motivation for this work is really this question of how do we design interventions such that we can achieve a desired outcome. Um, so this is a very important problem uh, that sees a lot of applications. For example, um, in biology, uh, we are focusing on um, this question of how to design genetic perturbations that can achieve um, cellular reprogramming. Uh, in this question, we are really interested in finding genetic interventions such that we can move from one cell type to a desired cell type. Um, there are also other applications. For example, how do you design the optimal controllers um, in um, turbulent flows? So um, this is one of the motivations. And the other motivation for our work is that uh, most of the systems in real life are generated by an underlying structural causal model. Um, so still sticking with this um, biology application. Um, so here, if we want to identify genetic perturbations such that we can achieve the desired outcomes, um, the measurement that we use is actually on gene expressions. Um, so in this, um, in this case, um, gene expressions is usually governed by an underlying directive uh, causal network, which is known as the regulatory network. Uh, I'm showing an example on the left here, where um, this is a huge network that connects between transcription factors and genes. Uh, and here, we would really want to identify genetic perturbations, such as, for example, overexpression uh, of a certain um, nodes in this graph that can uh, achieve the desired outcomes. Um, and in, in this network, uh, what is nice about the causal structure is that if you have this structure, then you would know that the genetic perturbations would only impact downstream genes. Therefore, you can find your optimal intervention with um, more efficiently. Um, so here, I'm going to delve directly into the problem setup. Uh, I'm calling this assumptions, or you can think of as a model that we use in this paper. Um, so we're using linear structural causal model with additive noise. Um, for example, I'm showing a four node um, directed acyclic graph here, where each node would depend linearly on its parents. For example, x4 equals to um, parameters b42 times x2 plus some extra x exogenous noise epsilon i. Um, and here we are modeling the ex uh, exogenous noise as additive Gaussian noises. Um, and he, in this framework, we're also considering a modeling for the interventions as shift interventions. Um, for example, shift interventions for a node xi would directly add ai to uh, its generative function. Um, and we're assuming that we know the DAC structure, but we don't know the hyperparameters or the parameters in this graph, which are bi's. Um, so our goal here is that given a target mean mu star, we would want to identify the optimal interventions such that the um, mean of the resulting intervention distribution defined by this shift intervention equation um, is equal to mu star. Um, so if we move in this equation, if we move this um, um, BIKXK stuff to the left, we will see that each sample x would equal to i minus b inverse times a i plus epsilon i. Um, so if we're generating n samples from intervention a, then its population mean can be written into this form, which is i minus b inverse times a plus n over one, uh, one over n times the sum of the exogenous noises. Um, and if we want to be able to match this mean mu star, uh, we want to define a metric between the population mean and the ground truth uh, target mean. So this is the, uh, we, we're simply using an L2 norm here. Um, so before talking about our proposed framework, I want to stop a little bit to talk about a, a previous work on the sort of questions. Um, so previous works that mainly, mainly uses two methods for actively acquiring samples. Uh, for example, there's this well-known um, framework called uh, integrated variance reduction which is developed back in the 90s. Uh, in this framework, they're considering modeling the unknown parameters in a Bayesian way, uh, where they select next samples based on minimizing the posterior variance of the outcome estimate. 
Um, another predominant uh, way of doing this is called Bayesian active learning by disagreement, uh, where both is usually maximizing some information gain, for example, mutual information between the samples and the quantity of interest. Uh, I want to say that most previous work are usually correlation-based, uh, which are these two works. A few recent works have explored the usage of causal relationships, for example, for treatment effect estimation uh, in last year's new reps and also for causal benefits. Um, our setup here is quite different from these two, uh, two works, two types of work that are targeted using um, causal relationships. Um, so right now I'm going to delve into our proposed framework. Um, so we're considering the iterative process of active, actively acquiring samples for the purpose of learning the optimal intervention. Um, this is trying to mimic a real experiment, for example, that a biologist would do in the lab to figuring out which genetic perturbation is can achieve the desired cell type. Um, and this process mainly involves three steps. You would first obtain some samples in the lab uh, by maybe uh, doing some random interventions. And then you would update your model belief about um, how does the intervention affect the outcome. And then based on this model, you would then select your next intervention by constructing an acquisition function, which tells you uh, how the interventions are going to be informative for your downstream goals. Uh, and after you select the intervention based on optimizing this acquisition function, you can then return it to the lab to obtain additional samples, which you go back to update your models and following this iterative process. Um, so in this framework, there are mainly two design steps. One is how do you design, how do you update your underlying structural causal model? And the other step is how do you construct an acquisition function such that it can prioritize most informative interventions for the purpose of learning the optimal intervention. So I'm going to talk about these two steps uh, in the following slide. Um, I'm not going to delve too much into the details. Um, but I will give you uh, like a flavor of how do we design these two steps. So the first thing, uh, first uh, main step is how do we update the underlying uh, structural causal model? Um, so we are using we're doing this um, by designing uh, what we are calling the DAG um, Bayesian linear regression distribution. So we're considering Bayesian studying where um, condition on um, previous samples, we update a belief on our underlying unknown model parameters B. Um, so we define this DAC BLR distribution. This is kind of similar if you're familiar with the DAC Wishard um, prior, um, but in the sense that we don't need to have the parameter constraints for, for it to achieve our, um, our uh, eventual goal. So the DAC BRR prior would model our um, unknown parameters B and the, also the noise variance of the exogenous noise sigma jointly as this um, product distribution, where um, now I'm assuming that uh, for each node, the incoming edges are uh, the incoming edges for each node for different nodes are independent. Um, and we're studying for each node is incoming parents, bi, parents of i, and also ex ex exogenous noise level to be uh, first uh, inverse gamma distribution and then a normal distribution based on the noise variance. Um, the nice thing about this stack BRR prior is that this gives us consciousness in the sense that if we set the prior to be um, of this form, uh, when we calculate the posterior, which is B sigma given our current data set DT, we would have um, this posterior of the same form. So we can update it pretty efficiently. Um, so I'm not going to talk about the second step of our model, which is how do we design acquisition functions such that it can prioritize most informative interventions for the purpose of uh, matching a target mean. Um, so I will do a brief recap on the objective, which you can see here, is that we're trying to minimize uh, this L2 distance between our population mean under intervention A with respect to the target mean mu star. Um, here, the B and epsilon are modeled using the DAC BLR distribution I just showed on the previous slide. Um, so a little tricky about this objective is that 
um, if you model B and epsilon in the previous way, you can see that if you want to calculate the posterior of this entire objective, it, it would be quite hard because it involved an inversion of matrix B. Um, so what we eventually do is that we uh, we are using this tractable form of um, the objective function by multiplying the inside terms uh, with I minus B. So in this way, we would reach like a pseudo objective function, GA, which measures the discrepancy between A plus exogenous noise from your samples minus I minus B times mu star. Um, so a little, uh, a little thing about this is that um, if you go back and look at the objective, you will see that uh, if you let n go into infinity, you can solve this minimization problem by setting a to i minus d times mu star. So in a sense, this term i minus b mu star is, is essentially the optimal intervention. Um, in this view, you can see that GA is actually measuring the optimal, um, the discrepancy between um, the selected intervention A and the optimal intervention. Um, so we are using GA to define an uncertainty of our estimation for the objective function, which is written into form as the variance of GA given our current data set DT. So for our purpose, we would really like to select our next intervention such that we can minimize the overall uncertainty um, to estimate GA. Um, so we define this as the causal integrated variance acquisition function which written into form, it would be in the integration of this uncertainty term characterized by variance integrated over all um, the potential values of intervention A. Um, so the nice thing about this is that um, when we are using a reasonable A, uh, we can see that uh, we can calculate uh, with details in our paper that the CIV acquisition function has exact closed form evaluations. Um, so this will allow us uh, to do efficient optimization, for example, using gradient-based algorithms. Um, so when we're looking at the CIV acquisition function, a natural question arises that, uh, can we just do better by, other than minimizing the overall uncertainty on the entire possible feasible set? Um, this is why we choose to look into this major new A. Um, so we can specifically design this measure new A such that it would place more weights on the interventions that are close to the optimality. Um, so here's the weight that we use. Uh, I'm not going to go into details of this weight, but if you look at uh, on 3D, it's basically um, behaving similar to bimodal volumized distribution, where B here it would be the estimated optimal intervention, and this weight would concentrate at um, directions that are close to B. Um, so if we use this way, this gives rise to our second acquisition function, namely the C, uh, CIV output weighted version. Um, so uh, after introducing the two like main steps of, of our framework, uh, I wanted to talk about uh, of our a little bit about our theoretical results. Um, so the nice thing about our framework is that we can actually prove some uh, theoretical guarantees, for example, mutual information maximization, uh, mutual information bound, and also consistency. Um, so by mutual information maximization, what I mean is that if we're minimizing the CIV acquisition function shown on the previous slide, it is actually effectively maximizing a lower bound to the mutual information between the quantity of interest uh, namely GA, and you obtain samples X prime from your next selected intervention A prime. Um, so in this like informal way of writing the theorem, uh, on the left side, you have the uh, mutual information. On the, on, on the right side, you have this complicated form uh, where essentially you can see that this term is actually the um, variance that was used in the CIV acquisition function where the sigma square and sigma square here are constant with respect to A prime. So if we are minimizing this equation with respect to A prime, um, then you're effectively maximizing this lower bound to your mutual information. Um, so this result is, um, is quite interesting because it connects our approach with the previous predominant approach, namely the Bayesian active learning um, by disagreement, which maximizes over um, the mutual information. 
However, our form of using our cost form evaluation of the acquisition function uh, kind of avoids invoking higher moments in the bulk framework um, or any usage of approximation techniques. So the other nice thing about this is that uh, once we make this connection of our acquisition function with the mutual information bound, uh, we actually are not sure whether um, this acquisition function would eventually give us the optimal intervention. Um, so we proved this result um, in the sense that we are proving that uh, our acquisition function would recover the optimal intervention in, approximate, in an appro appropriate limit. Um, so um, if we read um, A star as the optimal intervention as defined by letting the sample size go to infinity, then we can prove that this optimal intervention A star is an approximate O1 over T squared local minimum of the acquisition function at time step T. Uh, so what this is saying is that uh, in the limit of letting T goes into infinity, uh, our acquisition function H will recover A star. Um, but actually, if we do it numerically, we can see that uh, without going to infinity, you can see that with very uh, limited step, we can recover the optimal intervention. For example, if we consider a 10 node, 10 node deck here, where we intervene on five nodes um, that are um, like marked by this little lightning on the top, we can see that if we use our framework to try to identify interventions, after about uh, 50 steps, we can recover the optimal intervention A star. Uh, which is showing in this heat map. Um, so at last, I want to talk a little bit of our experimental results. So we tested our algorithm in both simulations and a semi-synthetic test that we performed over a real biological data set. Um, so in simulations, it's pretty standard. Uh, we're using a scaled model um, that was used by most causal structure learning uh, benchmarks. Um, here I'm showing an example of uh, performance on a 13 node DAG. So because this, um, this um, algorithm, it runs with uh, pretty high variance, um, especially if you're generating DAGs of different structures. So we, we, what we did here is that we generate 10 different instances of the same 13 node DAG with different, with different parameters B. And then we run each of the method on um, each one of the instances 20 times, and then we take the average. So here, our algorithms, um, the two acquisition functions are shown in orange and purple. Uh, we compare with other four baselines, uh, and this plot is showing at the last time step how it compares with respect to the baseline. So we observe that our proposed algorithm outperforms the uh, other benchmark that we consider also in various other settings. Uh, when we vary, for example, the deck size and also the intensity of the um, the intensity of the interventions. Um, so at last, I want to discuss um, this experimental result on the semi-synthetic test performed over this biological data set. So we considered this data set called um, that we received this from um, from online. This is called the perturbed site seek data set. Um, this is basically a single cell transcriptomic readouts for patient derived melanoma cells. Um, so, in English, what this means is that um, in here, our samples are single cell gene expression vectors. So, those X that are presented in previous equations correspond to single cells, and each entry is measuring the expression of one gene. Uh, and in this data set, the interventions are knockout of a specific gene in this long vector. Um, so we kind of, uh, what it looks on 2D is that we retrieve like tiny samples shown in this UMAP plot. And then we consider trying, uh, we consider these samples um, and we kind of mass out these samples and perform the active learning procedure to retrieve um, finite samples from this entire data set. Um, so we specifically consider 36 genes uh, from a specific pathway, and we learn a directly a, a, a cyclic graph over the 36 genes shown here. Um, so to perform the downstream task, uh, we kind of need to specific, uh, specify a knockout in the ground truth, uh, in the ground truth data set uh, uh, as our target intervention. 
Um, so in this plot, I'm showing exam an example where we selected knocking out of CDH19 as the ground truth uh, target intervention. Uh, so for the active learning procedure, we're essentially setting this, uh, the mean of this distribution as the target mean. And then we are trying to recover this by actively acquiring samples from the entire data set. Um, so I'm showing another two examples of knocking out of SOX4 and HLA-Z in here. You can see that SOX4 looks more similar to CDH19, uh, which is also captured by the square distance of their means. Um, so on this procedure, we run our algorithm. Um, here I'm showing at this, um, uh, this uh, decluttered point of showing only three um, acquisitions functions. And we can see that our, our proposed CIV acquisition function outperforms those baselines. This is also observed for other cases if we use other uh, knockouts as the ground shoes target intervention. Um, so with that, I'm going to conclude. Um, so in this work, we, pr uh, we propose an active learning framework for optimal intervention design in causal models. Uh, it mainly consists of two major design steps. Uh, where the first step is how to model and update the online causal structure model. Uh, here, we are using the DAG Bayesian linear regression distribution, um, and we do it in a Bayesian way. Um, and the second major component of our proposed framework is how do we design an acquisition function such that it would, um, it would prioritize interventions that are most informative of our downstream task. Um, so here we're proposing a class of um, causal, causal integrated variance acquisition function. The benefit of this uh, acquisition function is that um, it has efficient optimization, which is enabled by um, its tractable closed form evaluation. And also it has attractable theoretical properties, namely the mutual information bounds and also consistency with the optimal intervention. Um, and then we demonstrate our proposed frameworks on both synthetic data set and a biological data set. Um, so with that, um, that ends my talk. Um, thank you. And here's my references. And start, I guess, taking questions. Yeah, thank you, Jesse, for the great talk. Uh, we get a bunch of questions, so I'll, I'll, I'll state them. Uh, the first question is, so the interventions are not hard. So that means you don't mutilate the graph like post do calculus. Um, so, um, so the kind of the answer to that is a partially yes. Um, if you look at this equation where we use shift dimensions, we can actually set AI to be, sorry, I don't know why it's automatically playing. So we can actually set AI to be the minus of these terms um, so that eventually like uh, this two cancel out, you would have a hard intervention on node XI. Um, but we also try to do this for like multi-node hard interventions. Um, in that case, it's kind of undoable uh, of how to set AI such that this shift intervention would correspond to the hard intervention. Thank you for the answer. Um, so the next question uh, asks about the prior specification. So uh, the attendee asks, would any other priors for the approach also be possible? Oh, um, that's a good question. So uh, other priors for this framework would also be possible if, uh, if you can have a conjugacy. So the specific reason that we designed this or kind of borrow it from the deck uh literature is because this gives us the conjugacy so we can update the post areas efficiently. Uh, so imagine you use some other, other random prior, you might find it hard to calculate the post area. Um, but if you also change the, like the previous assumption, the model that you use, um, you will then need to design the corresponding priors for those kind of models. Um, but the acquisition function stands on its own. You just have to evaluate for different kinds of priors. I see. Just a, a follow-up question. So uh, as long as you uh, your uh, posterior is correct for your model, like your algorithm always converts to the optimal? Um, 
I would think not necessarily because in the proof that we showed consistency, we are specifically uh, using the form of the posterior and the calculation there is quite, uh, is quite complicated. So if you use a different posterior, I guess you would look into that as well. Um, there might also exist like alternative proofs that are general towards like um, all um, distribution families of um, conjugate priors. Um, but um, I would say that that's like very hard. Um, so it wasn't previously shown for any of the acquisition functions to kind of converge to the optimal intervention. This is kind of a new result. Um, yeah, I hope that answers partially the question. I see, thanks for your answer. <clears throat> so the next question we have is about the posterior sampling algorithm. So is the posterior sampling algorithm of, uh, of the MCMC type or any other? Mm -hmm. um, you mean, so- uh, Like how, how you sample your posterior? Are you using MCMC type algorithms or other algorithms? I see. Um, so the nice thing here is that um, we don't need to sample the posterior from, we not, don't need to sample from the posterior to be able to evaluate the acquisition function. Um, so like, remember here that we, uh, essentially we do these two steps where we update the model and then we uh, kind of select the intervention from optimizing the acquisition function. And then we obtain samples from the ground truth um, structural equation model. Um, so here, if we, uh, so eventually, essentially what we need to do to be able to get the next intervention is, um, is just lying in optimizing the acquisition function. So if you're able to evaluate that without drawing samples, without drawing, like, uh, drawing samples from the posterior distribution of the model, then you can kind of avoid uh, doing any sampling from the posterior. So we directly calculate that based on the closed form evaluations that we show in our paper. I see. Thanks for the great answer. Uh, we have a bunch more. Uh, things we have to st uh, still have time, we'll uh, uh, continue with that. Uh, the next one is, uh, in what way is the intervention optimal? Um, so that's defined by uh, its ability to achieve the target mean. So uh, an intervention would be optimal if this square distance between the population mean and the on the, the ground truth target mean is minimized. Thanks. We have a final question about, uh, have you thought about stopping, uh, uh, stopping criterion for the procedure? I see. Um, I have not specifically thought about the stopping criterion, uh, mainly for two reasons. Um, First is that uh, usually the stopping criterion is predefined. If we want to use this procedure in any applications, um, this stopping criterion is usually defined by the experimenter. Um, if you do it like in a bio lab, then they usually would tell you that uh, they can only perform, for example, five rounds of experiments because each round of experiments takes about a month. Um, so like a forehand, you will know how much time step you can do. Uh, and another thing is that the stopping criterion, I guess you could sort of measure, you could sort of define a stopping criterion by seeing the discrepancy with respect to the target mean, and then you divide it by the target mean uh, square distance. Um, if that's like close to zero, then you stop the algorithm um, in, in, um, in silico, not in the experimental lab. Thanks for the answer. Um, I think that's all for our questions. Also, thank all the all the great questions. Thank you. May I ask a question? Actually, uh, since I cannot type it up in the Q and A, um, could you comment on the need for linearity? I understood from your answer to one of the questions that the consistency result is somewhat tied to mm. having a specific form for your outcome, but like in, in, you have like many things that are changing, like you have a, ta a DAG, then you intervene, then you update things, and then you intervene again. Can you comment on like, in which parts of your algorithm and your procedure is linearity required? And where would you expect that we're able to relax it? I see. 
Um, so there are two ways. Um, the first, which is kind of, I think, essential is that um, this framework it needs to be able to predict the interventions that you haven't seen, how it would uh, affect the systems. So in this way, it's kind of like you're doing this um, out of distribution prediction. Um, and your sort of needs to have a parametric form of your underlying structural equation model in order to predict for the new intervention. Um, that's like one place where the linearity is used. And the other place is that when you're selecting the next intervention uh, by designing this acquisition function, uh, you need to be able to efficiently optimize this acquisition function to select for your next intervention. Uh, and this is the other place where the linearity is used. It is used to evaluate this acquisition function. So if you use another form of the linearity there, you kind of need to show that you can optimize this acquisition function efficiently. Um, and that in terms of the theoretical results, the consistency needs linearity because it's using the parametric form to show it. Um, but the mutual information bound, the link between our proposed uh, acquisition function with respect to the lower bound to the mutual information. Uh, it is it is true for any uh, any form of um, any form of that you use. Okay, thank you. Great. Um, yeah, thanks, Giachi. Um, so let's kind of wrap things up. Uh, there is another open question in the Q and A now. I'm sorry we are out of time, but uh, please be sure that all your questions will be forwarded to the our speakers. So we are right. So before we end, I just want to say thank you again to Raul and Giachi for great talks and the audience for all the wonderful questions and also Anish for stepping in and answering quite a few himself as well. Um, next week, we'll have a talk by Kun Zhang from CMU on methodological advances in causal representation learning. Hopefully you will all join us for that talk next week. And yes, uh, have a great day and a great rest of your week.